Okay, gang, let's take a look at chapter nine. So in chapter nine, we're gonna start our last major topic. And when I say major, I mean hypothesis testing. So in chapter nine, we're gonna look at hypothesized testing with one sample. All right, in chapter 10, we're gonna bump it up to two samples. And in chapters 11 and 13, we're gonna go three or more. So that's how this is gonna unfold over the rest of the semester. So chapters eight and nine are one sample, right? Chapter eight was one sample confidence intervals. Chapter nine is one sample hypothesis testing. In chapter 10, we're gonna do two sample hypothesis testing. And then in 11 and 13, we're gonna do the three or more. And you might be thinking, well, why are there two chapters for that? Um, when we get to the three or more version, we have three or more categories or proportions we're looking at and three or more averages or means that we're looking at. So we have different methods depending on if we have a categorical variable or a numerical variable. Or I could also rephrase that as we have different methods depending on if we're proportion land or in mean land. But all that aside, we're gonna look at one sample. So by the time you're done with this, this chapter, we should be able to differentiate between a type one and type two error. That's the first thing, the first concept we'll look at. And then we're going to run a hypothesis test. So we'll conduct a hypothesis test and there'll be stuff to interpret for a population mean, right? And I say single population because we're gonna do single samples or one sample in this chapter. And we're also gonna conduct and interpret hypothesis tests for proportions, all right? Single sample population proportion. But before we get into the nitty gritty of what do you do if you're in mean land versus what do you do if you're in proportion land, we, we've gotta really define the broader topic of what on earth is a hypothesis test? What, what is a null? What is an alternate? So we're gonna practice more of the, the theory before we get into the nitty gritty and we will get into the nitty gritty. Like it's, it's gonna be pretty intense what we do. But before we get to the nitty gritty, let's just stay like a level higher up, like just on the more of a surface, like what on earth are we doing here? Not so much how we do it. So a test hypothesis or test procedure is a method for using sample data to decide between two competing claims about a, high po about a population proportion. So a couple of things I wanna stress. We're gonna use sample data to make guesses about our population. What do we think is true about our population? And there's gonna be two competing claims that we'll call hypotheses, all right? We typically call them the null and the alternate. And I'll, I'll stress this, this term right here, that they have to be competing claims. And I'll talk about why they need to be competing claims when we actually get to a couple of examples. But basically, we're gonna have one claim about a population, a different claim about a population. And we're gonna decide between which of these two do we think is the truth, okay? Now, the null hypothesis, which we typically denote by H with a subscript of zero, so H sub zero, is a claim about a population parameter that is assumed to be true. So this one is assumed to be true. You always have to start somewhere. You have to believe something about your population. All right, and this is the one that we assume to be true. A lot of times you'll see this is the status quo. All right, um, just what's always been happening. All right, so H sub zero. It's our claim about our population that we assume to be true. And then competing with it will be the alternate. And we denote that by H sub A, and that's gonna be a competing claim, okay? And so when we get through all of this, and I say all of this because there's actually gonna be 13 steps that we're looking at, which I know can sound overwhelming initially, but at the end of it, if I just scooch this up a teeny bit here, at the end of all of this, in step 13, believe it or not, you're either gonna tell me one of two things. You're gonna say, I reject H naught, or I fail to reject H naught. Now I put these in parentheses because you can't actually say this in the stats world, but I, I also wanna give us just um, a, a more real world look, not real world, but just like wrap our brains around how we would say things in the real world. Um, and I know this is a lot I'm, I'm putting out there, but let me give you a for example. So in terms of rejecting H naught and failing to reject H naught and why we're saying concluding the alternate is true or concluding H naught again in quotes is true. I'll talk about the quotes in just a bit. I think the most common real world example before we get into, like I said, the nitty gritty of this is you have seen, I'm sure at some point, some kind of law and order um, episode or some kind of television show 
where there's a court involved. And we know this. We know that in the criminal justice system, we are innocent until proven guilty. All right, so I'm gonna start to use this idea with our notation for stats. So we would say the null hypothesis is that a person is innocent, right? We assume you are innocent. It's assumed to be true. So we don't essentially have to prove this because we get to assume it's true. Okay, right? And you are innocent until proven guilty. And the burden of proof falls here, right? In the alternate. So the alternate hypothesis is the competing claim. You can see that these are competing claims. And I'm gonna put here, right? The burden of proof always falls on the alternate. So we've got that, and again, I'll put here, a lot of times we hear this phrase out on, a, like I said, on Law and Order or whatever the current show is. I think there's like Chicago Law or, I don't know. I don't watch that much TV anymore, uh, other than Game of Thrones, which is about to go off. All right, so we got innocent until proven guilty. Now, Something that you may not have paid attention to um, before this is, is the type of verdicts that a jury can push back. So the two types of verdicts that they can push back are is they will either declare you guilty, right? Or what's the other one? Not guilty. So let me write guilty and not guilty and let's have a talk about this. And why I say you may have never paid attention to this before is, has anyone ever paid attention to the fact that they don't declare you innocent, right? So it's not, we find you guilty or innocent. It's either we find you guilty or not guilty. So I wanna point out that when, even in the court of law, when they push back the verdict, just take note that the phrasing is always about the alternate because you can see nowhere in here is the word innocent. So when I come back to the two possible conclusions, right? Reject H naught or fail to reject H naught. What's happening here is if we reject H naught, right? We reject that you're innocent, we're saying you're guilty. But if we fail to reject H naught, the reason I put this in quotes is true, right? That H naught is true is because I'm actually not saying you're innocent. I'm just saying you're not guilty. You have not convinced me of your guilt. So you can think of it, there's almost like a spectrum, right? Here's hardcore guilt, right? You're definitely guilty. Here's innocent, right? And so this, this area in between, right? This is the not guilty phase. So I'm not saying you're innocent. I'm just saying you haven't told me or you haven't proven to me you're guilty. That's why we say we either reject it or we fail to reject it. So I'm not, in terms of rejecting the null, if I reject it, I'm flat out telling you you're guilty. If I fail to reject the null, Right? Fail to reject. I fail to reject this. I'm not saying for sure you're innocent. It's just you haven't shown me you're guilty. And I don't know if you watch or listen to the serial podcast. And if you haven't, you can kind of ignore me on this. But if you have, I, I for me, it's like the perfect example of this. Because if you hear, or at least when I listened to the serial podcast, you might not have felt this way when you listened to it. But when I listened to it, like in terms of um, what happened with Heyman Lee and Adnan Syed, like I definitely thought Adnan was not guilty, but I'm also not sure that he's innocent, right? I, you, that serial podcast did not convince me of his guilt, but he might have been a little shady, and I, I, I might be totally wrong. Again, this was just you know something that I listened to back in 2014, and I was obsessed with for a while. But to me, again, all of the that all of the case findings. And what was presented in the in the podcast, and I, I get that I wasn't in the actual jury box. Um, I didn't believe he was guilty, right? But I didn't believe he was innocent either. He, just to me, he was not guilty. They hadn't convinced me of his guilt. And and why this can be so um, just awkward is in the real world we don't say things like this. So when you apply to college, right? If you apply to college, when you get that letter back 
from college, they say, we either accepted you or we rejected you, right? So they reject you, right? That we're used to hearing, or they, you'll hear, oh, you're accepted in. They don't phrase it as, oh, we failed to reject you from this college, right? Nobody ever says that in the real world. Or if you ask somebody out on a date, right? You usually get like a yes or no. No one says, oh, I failed to reject your date offer. So that's why this phrasing can be a little bit tough. Um, it makes sense in the stats world. And we'll, we'll keep circling back to this, right? Why we say fail to reject the null, all right? And we always make our, our conclusions about the alternate. But I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to that when we really start going into the 13 steps that are involved in one of these stats proofs. All right, so we're gonna making a whole bunch of, this test procedure's got a whole bunch of stuff we gotta write up. And I split it into 13 steps, which I know sounds overwhelming, but not all of them are super hard. Some of them are, all right? But I, I gave us an orderly way to write up this test procedure. You can think of it kind of like when you're in a uh, science class and you have a lab write up. I gave you a very particular way of writing this. And I, I know this is just the first time we're looking at hypothesis tests together, but as we start to go through chapters nine and 10 and 11 and 13, those, those 13 steps won't seem as overwhelming. But right now, yeah, they do. All right, so let's start to take a look at how our null and our alternate are written. So if you want to ever, let me scooch this up, if you wanna write me a proper, a properly noted null and alternate, this is what it'll look like. So you'll write h sub zero, and you'll hear me talk about how you should have colons right after them, okay? So there's your null with a colon. You will have a parameter, all right? And in this chapter, your parameter will either be mu, because you're in mean land, or it'll be p because you're in proportion land. So for chapter nine, those are the only two symbols we'll use, mu or p. And then there's gonna be some hypothesized value, some number that you're getting from the wording of your problem. And I don't know what that number will be. It'll change for every problem that we have, all right? And then in terms of the alternate, you will either tell me h sub a, right? Notice that the subscript has changed. We're going from the null to the alternate. It'll still have a colon. Whatever the symbol was in your null, it'll be the same symbol in your alternate. So if you had a mu here, there'll be a mu here, okay? If you had a p here, there will be a p here. Now the symbol's gonna change. You will either have a greater than test, a less than test, or a not equals to test. All right, so greater than, less than, or not equals to. Now let me give us some vocab so that we have this. These two, these are called your one-sided tests. All right, and this one is a two-sided test. Sometimes the greater than version will be referred to as the right-tailed test. That's another way you could describe this. And the less than version will be called the left-tailed test. All right, and then there's times when we will call the not equals to version the two-tailed test. Okay. So let's just get some, or draw some conclusions or just some summaries of what's common, what's different. Okay, so things that are common. Uh, you're gonna, have, well, let's start with things that are different. You have h sub zero here, h of a here, but you basically have an h with a superscript. After each of the null and alternate symbols, put the colon, that's always the next thing. Decide if you're gonna use a mu or a p based on the wording of your problem. If you're in mean land or you have a numerical variable, use mu. If you're in categorical land, or excuse me, proportion land, or you have a categorical variable, use p. Whatever symbol you use in the null, use it in the alternate. Whatever number you use in the null, use it in the alternate. The only thing that changes from the null to the alternate is this symbol. Now the equal sign will always go on the null. There will be times when the null sounds like it should be greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. That's all fine and good. Use the equal sign. All right, always put the equal sign here. You will pick up greater than, less than, or not equals to based on the wording of the problem. And we're gonna practice that in just a moment. All right, if all else fails, if you're not sure, Right? If you're just like, I don't know, here, default to a not equals to test, okay? I'm gonna write this here, 
and we again we will circle back there's a lot of things we're going to unpack in this chapter we will circle back that not equals two tests are equivalent to confidence intervals all right they are equivalent under most well not under most circumstances under certain circumstances um, to confidence intervals those things that we talked about in chapter eight okay a couple of bullet points that I, I want to make sure I mention before we start practicing this is make sure in your null and your alternate that you always have parameters, never statistics. So what I mean by that is this should always be a mu or a p. It should never be x bar or p prime. We're going to use sample data, again, to prove or disprove one of these claims, but never put those, those symbols in your in your null or alternate. So your null and alternate are always based on parameters, never statistics. Okay, I mentioned this already, but I, I think it's great to repeat it. The null, h sub zero, always has the equal symbol in it. Okay, There will be problems where it feels like the null should have a symbol like less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. That's nice, just write equals to. Some teachers are gonna opt to put less than or equal to or greater than equal to, but not me. So not the teacher from whom you're taking this stats class. So just for, for our class moving forward, the null will always have the equal sign. Okay. All right. And then in terms of the alternate, HA never has the equals in it. It'll either have a less than, a greater than, or a not equals to. The choice of the symbol depends on the wording of the problem. All right. And I just mentioned this was the default, but you can think of this when I say this is a two-sided or two-tailed test. This includes both the less than test and the greater than test, okay? So this symbol includes both of these together. So there's times when we'll just wanna look at the left tail, those, there's times when we wanna look at the right tail, and then there's times that we wanna look at both tails or two tails. And when I talk to, about two tails, imagine you've got your bell curve because a lot of these are gonna be on the normal distribution. And you either wanna look at the area under the curve on the left, the area under the curve under the right, or both of them at the same time. All right, so when you see a not equals to, it's both of these together, okay? All right, so with that, when we flip the page, we're just gonna practice the symbols behind all of this and try and get that to gel. See you in a bit, bye. Okay, gang, so let's start to really hone in on just the notation side of things. And as I read each of these examples on this page, uh, our, our standard question, our starting off question is, what land am I in? Mean land or proportion land? Same rules as chapter eight apply here. We're gonna be doing different stuff, right? We're gonna run a hypothesis test and not a confidence interval. That's okay, but let's read through this. So Phillips, 13 watt CFL light bulb stayed on the package lasts 9.1 years. Let mu denote the true average lifespan of Philips 13 watt CFL light bulbs. People who purchase this brand would be unhappy if mu is actually less than the advertised value. How would we write our null and alternate hypotheses? Okay, so I've got some information. We've got some light bulbs we're gonna look at and they're talking about a null or alternate hypothesis. All right, so I know I'm gonna be doing a hypothesis test, but what land am I in? So as I read this, I think a couple of things popped out. I saw the word average in there, okay? That would be one indication that I was in mean land. I also saw some units in here, right? You see years, okay. As soon as you have units, you know you're also looking at a numerical variable. Because when it's categorical, you keep a frequency count and turn it into a proportion. But I've got some units. Okay, I also see mu, right, in a couple of places. So those are three different indications that I'm in mean land. So let me just go denote that over here. So we've got mean land. All right, and then it asks me just to write our null and our alternate. So I'm not gonna run a hypothesis test. In fact, I can't, I don't have enough information, but I can at least get my null and my alternate. All right, null should always have h sub zero and a colon. Alternate should always have h sub a and a colon. So that is your standard notation for your null and your alternate, okay? So as we look at this, the symbol here I'm gonna use is mu because I am in mean land. So I'm gonna have mu here with an equal sign 
and then I have to decide what I'm going to do for the alternate, but I'll come to that in just a moment. So what is the claim? What does Philips, that light bulb brand, claim about their 13 watt CFL light bulbs? They claim 9.1 years. Okay, so I believe the true average is 9.1 years. I have no reason to disbelieve them right now. If I did, I could go collect data. And we and that's what you would do ultimately with this, but that's their claim. So we're gonna assume they're telling the truth. All right, so I've got 9.1 years as my, as my null. That means your alternate will have the mu here. It will also have 9.1 years. The thing that we have to decide between is do I have a less than symbol here, a greater than symbol here, or a not equals to symbol here. So when it comes to the alternate, you are always choosing between one of these three symbols. Do I have greater than, less than, or not equals to? And like I said, if you're not sure, just default to the not equals to. These are like confidence intervals and it's good enough, all right? But if, if the clue is given in the wording of the problem, you wanna address that. So let's look for, was there a slant to the word in the wording of the problem? And, and there is, you can see it here. They're saying customers would be unhappy if the mean was actually less than the advertised value. So we're suspicious that this company, this Philips light bulb company, is overselling how long their light bulbs last. So we think this is less than 9.1 years, okay? And I also wanna come back to this idea that I had underlined previously of competing claims, right? So when you have your two hypotheses, they should be competing with each other, all right? And they should be competing about a parameter, which they are, they're competing about mu. And you know, if we were gonna fill this out or finish this out, we would get sample data to decide which one we thought was true or false. But let's check if they're competing. And here's what I mean by that, okay? If you ran your experiment, you went to, I don't know, Target or Home Depot or maybe some of each, and you got a bunch of these CFL light bulbs and you found out how long they lasted. I mean, it'd be a fun time trying to last 9.1 years. Um, you, you could decide, um, if you went through and did that and decided, okay, I think the null is true, I'll keep it, or I think I'm gonna reject it. If you come up with these two options, right? Let's say you fail to reject the null. Are you with me that these would be happy customers? So if you went through this experiment and found out at the end, hey, it looks like Philip is telling the truth. Phillips, excuse me, is telling the truth. If, if the mean does look like it really could be 9.1 years, okay, that's great. That's what they were claiming and we thought that was true. If you found out that the mean was actually less than 9.1 years, you would have some unhappy customers. Okay. And you do not need to write these each time, but what I want you to see is that these are competing. So you would lead to two different conclusions depending on if you kept the null, or I should say if you failed to reject the null or if you rejected it, right? Happy versus unhappy customers. One other thing that I, I wanna mention here, okay? Let me put a couple of notes. So I'll call this note one. I think theoretically, yes, I'm putting the equal sign, but are you with me that mu, the null here could have been greater than or equal to, right? If you found customers, or if you found out that the, the light bulbs actually lasted longer than 9.1 years, you're still gonna have happy customers. So I'm gonna just gonna put the H naught could have said, mu is greater than or equal to 9.1. All right, even though it sounds like it should be greater than or equal to, again, notationally in this class, we're just gonna put the equals to symbol, okay? The other thing I just want to point out for, for vocab purposes is that we would call this a left-tailed test, all right? Or maybe you would call it one-sided, but let me write that this is a one-sided, or you could call it left-tailed test, just so we can practice that vocab together, okay? So I've got two competing claims great. I think mu is either what they're claiming it to be, or maybe it's less than what they claim for it to be. And again, it sounds like mu really could have been greater than or equal to 9.1, but for this class, we're just going to put the equal symbol in the null. 
and we would call this a left tail test because when you go less than, you're going to the left side of your normal distribution, or you could call it one-sided because it's just less than, okay? Less thans and greater thans, we call those one-sided tests. If it's not equal to, we call it a two-sided test. All right, so with that, let's check what's going on in example two. Again, as I read this, am I in mean land or am I in proportion land? So I'm gonna scooch this up and let's see what land we're working with here. Okay, so we've got, because of the variation in the manufacturing process, tennis balls produced by a particular machine do not have identical diameters. Let mu denote the true mean diameter for tennis balls currently being produced. Suppose that the machine was initially calibrated to achieve the design specification of mu equaling three inches. However, the manufacturer is now concerned that the diameter is no longer conformed to this specification. Determine the null and alternate hypothesis. All right, that's a lot of words, but I'm hoping a few things stand out to you. So things that I notice as I'm reading through this, I see mu, first of all, that's a dead giveaway you're in mean land. I see the word mean, right? So I'm looking at the average diameter for tennis balls. I also see units here, right? And that is actually tied to mu equaling three inches, right? But any of those are, are indicators that for this problem, you're in mean land. So let me just go note that I am in mean land. And it's asking me to get the null and alternate hypothesis. Okay, so here we go. H naught, colon, H A, colon. Sometimes you'll hear me refer to these as ho and ha. All right, I'm not at all trying to be respectful, calling anything a ho, but we got ho because of H sub zero and ha. All right, H sub A. And again, after each of those should come that colon every single time. All right, so let's take a look. If I'm in mean land, I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna have a mu and an equals two here. You know you're gonna have a mu down here, I just don't know the symbol. All right, and they, they say it right here, mu is equal to three inches. Okay, All right, whenever you have a numerical variable, you can have some units. It looks like our units are inches. All right, then we need to decide what the alternate is. And you always have three choices with your alternate. It can be a greater than, it can be a less than, or it can be a not equals to. All right. And somewhere in the wording of the problem should be a clue. And if you don't see it, default to the two-sided test. So here we go. We got all this setup info, but it, here, here's the key. However, the manufacturer is now concerned that the diameters no longer conform to this specification. So when you hear this phrase, right, no longer conform, all right, that's not slanting you one way or the other, right? He's just saying, hey, I don't think they're three anymore. It's not that I think they're greater than three or less than three. I just don't think that they are three anymore. And imagine if you were a tennis player, right? If you were a tennis player, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put this on the side and then I'm gonna erase it. Would you be upset if the average diameter was greater than three inches? I sure would. I don't want a really large tennis ball, right? Would I be upset if the mean was less than three inches? Yes, I would also be upset there because I don't want a ping pong ball, right? I want a tennis ball. The diameter of our tennis balls should be three inches. So when you hear this, this is actually mu does not equal three inches, right? No longer conform. It's not slanting you one way or the other. The manufacturer is not worried that the diameters are too small. It's not worried that they're too big. It's worried that they no longer conform to that specification of three inches, okay? Now, let's make sure we have competing claims. Ooh, I put my little divider too soon. All right, if you wind up rejecting the null, right? Let's say you believe the alternate is true. We would say that these are bad tennis balls. So we could conclude ultimately something's wrong with the manufacturing process. Okay, if you fail to reject the null, or in a way you say you keep the null, if mu was really three, these would be good tennis balls. And I say that checks out. These are competing claims. That's a good thing. We want our null and our alternate to be in competition with one another. 
I don't want these to both say good tennis balls or them to both say bad tennis balls. I need them to compete. I need to have different outcomes depending on if I reject the null or I fail to reject the null. All right, so a little note here. Our alternate was a not equals to test. So I want you to hear this not equals to, we could call it a two-sided test or a two-tailed test. All right, so when you have a not equals to symbol, we call that, again, you could call it a two-sided test. You could call it a two-tailed test. And why we call it two tails is because we're gonna be on the bell curve and we're gonna shade stuff on the low end and the high end of that bell curve on both tails. So when in doubt, go with a two-tailed test or a two-sided test, okay? So when in doubt, go with a two-sided test. All right, so we're gonna head to example three. All right, I'm gonna give you a couple of sets of hypotheses. We're gonna see if we can pick between them and see which one, which one gives us competing claims. So again, as I read this, what land am I in? All right, let me move this up. Okay, so here we go. All right, it says a certain university has decided to introduce the use of a plus and minus with letter grades, as long as there is evidence that more than 60% of the faculty favor the change. A random sample of faculty will be selected and the resulting data will be used to test the relevant hypotheses. All right, if P represents the true proportion of all faculty that favor a plus minus grading, which of the following pairs of hypothesis should be the administration test. Okay, so here we go. Let's see which one of these sets is correct. Now, first of all, what land are we in? All right, that's the first thing we always wanna figure out. So there's a couple of things here that I, I see. I see the word proportion. It's a great clue that we're in proportion land. I see the letter P, another great clue, but also do we see this number 60%, right? There are the units, every proportion is got units of percentages. So we are in proportion land. Because ultimately our variable is categorical, right? When I take this random sample of faculty, I'm going to ask them, are you in favor of this proposed change? Either they'll say yes or no. That's what's gonna vary between them, right? Yes, I agree with the change. No, I don't agree with the change. And that's a categorical variable. So we'll keep a frequency count divide by the sample size, turn it into a relative frequency or a proportion, and that's what we're gonna be testing, okay? So we know we're in proportion land, and as you look at your null and alternate, or these two sets of competing claims, you see that the null is the same for each of them. So let's just take note that, right, both of them have P's in them, right? Both nulls and alternates, that's great, they should. And they also have the same numbers here. The only thing that changes is the symbol. Every null should have the equal sign, Okay, great. And the alternate here is, do we have a less than test or a greater than test? Now there is a word that gives it away in here, but before we do the word that gives it away, I want us to just think about competing claims, okay? So let's look at this. It says, as long as there's evidence that more than 60% of the faculty favor the change, this, this university is gonna make, favor the change. So, so let's start here. If they conduct this experiment or this survey, and it's really true that it's exactly 60%, the true proportion is 60%, are they gonna make the change or not gonna make the change? If it's exactly 60%, right, that is not more than 60%, so we're not gonna make the change here. So let me write, you don't change system. In your alternate, and that's that's the, the gist of the alternate. G alternate, no, excuse me, in your null. That's the gist of the null, not the alternate at all. So in the null, it's always the status quo, nothing's changing. So you just keep things as is, all right? Now, if P was less than 60%, would you change the system or not change the system? Well, if P is less than 60%, that is also not in the more than 60%, so I'm still not gonna change the system. So this presents a problem in that you do not have competing claims. So at the end, whether you think the null is true or the alternate is true, either way, you're not gonna change the system. 
So this can't be a legitimate set of hypotheses because these are not competing claims. So over here, we talked about if P is equal to 60%, we already said, hey, we're not gonna change the system, right? Keep the status quo, which is always what the null is dealing with. Okay, no problem. All right, but here, if, if P was truly greater than 60%, right? It says if it's more than 60% who favor the change, if there's enough evidence there, the university is going to do that. So if we go here, this is change the system. Okay, well, I think you can see here we do have competing claims, right? So if I reject the null, I'm going to change the system. If I fail to reject the null, I'm not going to change the system. So you can see this has got to be our correct set of hypotheses, all right? And the, the phrasing that would give it away is right here. It was right next to the 60%, right? Evidence that more than 60%, okay? More than 60%, and really that word evidence is key also. You're gonna hear the word evidence pop up all over the place when you're dealing with um, hypothesis tests. But that's why I wanted to highlight, at least on the first page, that idea of competing claims. They have to lead you, these null and alternate have to lead you to different conclusions. If they led you to the same conclusion, like they did in this set of hypotheses, then what's the point? Because no matter what you find in your survey, you're not gonna change the system. But here, if you're going this way, depending on what you find in the survey, you might change the system or you might not change the system. Okay? And that's how hypothesis tests work. We make claims, we go out, we're gonna get a sample of data, and then based on our sample data, we're gonna say, oh, okay, I think the alternate's true or I think the null's true. Or really, we're gonna say, we think the alternate's true or we don't think the alternate's true. We're gonna use that, that funky phrasing of we reject the null or fail to reject the null. All right, so last one on this page. All right, multiple choice question. So let's see what we got going on here, okay? All right, so here we go. The manufacturer of a refrigerator system for beer kegs produces refrigerators that are supposed to maintain a true mean temperature, mu, of 40 degrees Fahrenheit, for ideal, ideal for a certain type of a German Pilsner. The owner of the brewery does not agree with the refrigerator manufacturer and claims that he can, play, that he can prove that the true mean temperature is incorrect. Okay, so first things I'm noticing here in terms of what land am I in, I see the word mean all over the place. Okay, here's mean, okay. I thought I saw it again, yeah, mean. I saw the word mu. I saw units, right? Degrees Fahrenheit. So all of those are giving me clues to the fact that I'm in mean land. Okay. The next thing I'm asked is, uh, which of these hypotheses are correct? All right, or, or which of these hypotheses match, I should say. So if I look at this, right, first of all, I can, I can rule out A because I don't see the equal sign here. I can rule out B, I don't see the equal sign. I can rule out C, I don't see the equal sign. D's got an equals, E's got an equal. So as I look through all the nulls, anything without an equal sign gets ruled out, okay? All right, so let's see what's going on here, right? It says the owner of a brewery does not agree with the refrigerator manufacturer and claims he can prove that the true mean temperature is incorrect. Okay, so the true mean temperature is incorrect. They're claiming it's 40 degrees. If it's incorrect, there's not a slant either way, right? He's not saying, I think that the refrigerator is hotter than what you claim. We're saying incorrect. So as we start to look at that word, incorrect, you can see that since there's not a slant in one direction or the other, we're looking at a not equals to, right? And you could imagine, the not equals to includes both, right? And it's called a two-sided test. So that this includes mu is less than 40 degrees and mu is greater than 40 degrees. Or really I should say or, if I'm being technical, all right? And imagine if you were drinking a beer, you don't want it to be too cold and you don't want it to be too hot. So we do really wanna see if, if it's supposed to be 40 degrees and the reading's incorrect, it's just something other than 40 degrees. This is only a one-sided test. We actually need a two-sided test here. All right, so with that, we've got a few of these notations under our belt, right? We've got competing claims. We've got colons after the ho and the ha. The symbol in all of these is the same. So if there's a mu in the null, 
put them you in the alternate. If there's 40 degrees in the null, put 40 degrees in the alternate. The only thing that changes after that colon is the symbol here. There's always an equals here, and it'll either be a less than, greater than, or not equals to. All right, so let's learn what some type one and type two errors are, and we'll keep on going. I'll see you in a bit. Bye.